Welcome on into the Fantasy Football Forge. My name is Steve, and it is time for the wide receiver positional preview video. And um, there's a lot to get through, so let's let's get going. A couple of quick announcements. First of all, as we have been doing on Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, you can come join me, join the community as we live mock draft. Uh, typically, there have been people here last Thursday. Unfortunately, nobody was able to make it, but hopefully it'll be like the exact opposite this week. And next week, I will be going live a bunch uh, leading up to Labor Day weekend since that is the most popular drafting weekend. So that way you can come join me whenever is most convenient for you, hopefully, and, uh, and get some practice reps in. Also, I will be releasing my final rankings videos uh, throughout the week as well next week. So that would be the only thing getting in the way of me missing a day or two two of, um, of, of mock drafting. Also, I would just like to quick encourage you to go check out my series on player highlights going through uh, each of those players, Marvin Harrison Jr., Zamir White, the, the three wide receivers for Houston, James Cook, David Njoku, Anthony Richardson, Dalton Kincaid, Chase Brown, Detroit Lions backfield, Miami Dolphins backfield. In each of those scenarios, going over, uh, doing a projection, kind of uh, walking you through what to expect from them or, or what I'm expecting and where that, that helps to either support or go against where they're currently being drafted as if you are the individual who requested a Mike Evans video. Uh, I, I, I slipped in a little bit of talk about Mike Evans at the end of, I believe it's the Detroit Lions backfield video. It could have been the Miami Dolphins backfield video. One last thing, don't forget, you can go up onto my website, www.theffforge.com. There's a link down in the description to it in order to get my most recent rankings, which will be, uh, you know, uh, as... As those rankings videos come out, there still might be some changes. So those are the most recent rankings that you can view there. Obviously, up top of the website, you can just click rankings to see them. And here you will also see. So here's the rankings uh, for each position. DST overall rankings have not been updated recently. I will try to get to that. But just a heads up, um, those are a little bit more dated than the rest. Um, and I have on each of them when the last update was. Uh, 2024 printable draft sheet, though. You know what these are, the cheat sheets that sometimes your manager might bring to the league for you. Here is mine from my most recent draft. Uh, worked out very nicely, so this is uh, influenced by my draft rankings, but it also equally is influenced by the ADP. So uh, it and the tiers that I have on here worked out really nicely for me, I thought, uh, in terms of kind of knowing when to attack, when I could lay back at a position uh, and end up with somebody that, uh, you know, I still liked uh, and I didn't lose out on anything by waiting around maybe at one position compared to attacking uh, the opposite posi position. Also, a uh, quick reminder too, tip, if your league manager, somebody brings in sheets like this and everybody's using the same sheet or a lot of people are, grab that sheet, look at it in both instances. If you print off my sheet, if you bring... Uh, if you use the sheet in your league or if you just have it near you for the purpose of seeing uh, what other people are drafting from, go through each of those lists before the draft and go asterisk any players who are higher or lower than you uh, would expect them to be than they are in your personal rankings. So that way uh, you have kind of a reminder of which guys you might want to reach for, which guys you might be able to take a chance on letting them fall a little bit further in drafts. You'd be surprised how much these types of sheets can influence people's rankings, especially if a lot of people in your league are using the same sheet. Uh, it can really help you to better navigate throughout the draft by having that access. And that brings us into what you're going to get in this video. Uh, a general, historical, wide receiver information is what we're going to be looking at. Uh, historical, a lot of this information is going to be coming from uh, specific uh, analyses that I actually did just uh, a couple years ago based on the 2021 season and also uh, information that I've been uh, been collecting over the past three years of data, et cetera, which you can find up on my website in terms of the article that we will be uh, approaching later up top. You can see where I have articles. If these are not small articles. These are like 30-page uh, college uh, data-rich 
essay type things that aren't exactly like fun reading. So just a heads up, uh, don't expect any kind of fun reading if you wanted to look into those. But I will uh, bring that up a little bit later. Uh, also in here, I'll be uh, breaking down how I view the tiers via ADP to break down within those tiers, the targets, busts, sleepers, full PPR targets, boom potential guys, bust potential guys, just kind of pointing out each of those uh, relevant to the tiers that that stand out to me. And I'll finish up by talking about my, my approach, my strategies regarding the wide receiver position. So first, a little bit of information about the creme de la creme of the position, uh, how they perform, as well as how statistically the wide receivers take uh, uh, tiers break down for me. So we'll start off looking at this top, uh, the difference makers of the position. You can find gems most years, but the value... I think is much harder to find this year. Uh, people are being a lot more aggressive with the wide receivers, especially some of the higher end uh, potential wide receivers. The rookie type guys are going a little bit higher than I think we've typically seen in the past. So um, I do want to be aggressive with the wide receiver position to preface this, but uh, especially these difference makers at the wide receiver position are great to be able to get looking back at the last three years of data. So this is in part, some of that information that you could find in that article uh, going back to 2021, I found that there was one tier one difference maker and two tier two difference makers. So there's just a little bit of a separation between that. I think that was Cooper Cup that year that had one of those amazing years separating himself from the next two and then the next two separate themselves from kind of the pack. Uh, 2022, going back and looking, drawing some similar parallels, I found two tier one difference makers, four tier two difference makers. 2023, one tier one difference maker, two. So the same as 2021. So on average, we're thinking there's about three to five difference makers at the wide receiver position, guys who really separate themselves from the rest of the pack. When you get to the third tier of wide receivers, uh, that's roughly 15 wide receivers deep. I looked back at 2021, 2022, 2023, 2022, 2021. I mean, there was a duo at the top of this group that kind of stood out as well. And then there was uh, 15 more, so a total of like 17 in that tier. 2022, there was a trio that stood out of the group, uh, and there was a, a group of 14 in total, including that trio, plus or minus. And then just last year, there was about 13 to 15, depending on exactly how you wanted to cut that off. No, no next tier, really, that had anybody that stood out. So about 15 wide receivers deep. Just kind of pointing out that every year it's a little bit different. It's not a clear cutoff here into this next tier at tier four, where there's another large group of about 15 wide receivers or so each year that are going to be a little bit different from others. This is also, once again, still based on some of that data that I collected uh, two years ago in terms of how these tiers are breaking down and thought of. And that's where when we get to this fifth tier, what I'm talking about is uh, statistically over the entirety of the season, these this next tier, these 10 wide receivers really aren't going to uh, be of a benefit to your team, but they're not a liability either, right? Which means that there's typically this group of about 40 or so wide receivers that are uh, not a liability for you. And once you get past that group of 40, 45-ish wide receivers, you start to become a liability. And I'm going to quick show you now up on the website. When we go to the wide receiver analysis, I'm going to show you a couple graphs. I'm not going to explain them. That would be too much, and there's so much that goes into it ahead of time. Here's kind of just the the overview, if you wanted to look at this, this is really the most pertinent information and a little bit of a profile that I wrote up on the wide receiver position uh, before it really gets into it. But there are a couple of graphs that really show how this this works uh, in just in terms of seeing how there's there's a rise here in the the macro view of how the relative change in scoring works throughout the position up until about the wide receiver 40 before you start to see that turn uh, downwards, you know, actually turn downwards. And if we look at a little bit more of a micro view from that, but still not uh, micro, you'll see that the things, once again, like I said, you start to even out. You think of that 10, that group of 10 here between 30 and 40-ish, uh, where where this, this line has flattened out here on the screen uh, before it starts to go down a little bit more. Just a little bit of visual evidence to support 
the fact that uh, th- you know we're looking at these top uh, 35 ish 30 35 wide receivers who are really going to be helping your team uh, week in and week out throughout the entirety of the season so when you combine that information with some of the information that I go over later about wide receiver durability injury stuff and the lack of reliable options that will pop up pop up in a season they're a good investment to grab early in drafts another way to look at this is that it means that you are should be fine attacking consistency through the top 40-ish wide receivers. Uh, These are the guys who you don't need to take too much risk on. You don't need to attack the upside. But once you're outside of this top 30, 40, I mean, ish wide receivers, that's when you need to start attacking upside because uh, what does a consistent wide receiver 45? The wide receiver 45 consistently getting you Uh, a wide receiver 40 finish each and every week is not going to help you win your league or win each of those individual games. If anything, uh, that should be maybe hurting you, maybe, you know, keeping you in the fight, but they're not going to be helping you and you need to be attacking for guys who have the potential to, to put up those top 30 type of wide receiver numbers is what you're really looking for. So for this next section, we're going to pull up uh, the ADP rankings via Fantasy Pro's website. Uh, there it is. We're going to be looking at uh, the tiers quite a bit. Um, got, for some reason, the running backs listed up here. Let's get the wide receivers up. Tiers, ADPs could have changed a little bit since I started, since I wrote down my notes on this Uh but I think I went over it just a little bit ago. Looked pretty similar at the very least. So uh, just because I'm saying this is generally speaking about these tiers, these are not my rankings. So sometimes there might be a player that I, I would say, well, I don't think this about that player. But let's just go over how I broke these tiers down. I do want to mention I actually did this portion before I went back and looked at my old data and everything and created those that information I just went over about each of the tiers. Yet the numbers still pretty much line up. For me, the tier one wide receivers, when I break this down and I got to I gotta take a cutoff in my confidence level, is going to be at Garrett Wilson, my wide receiver seven. However, I, I could cut it off at a Monterey St. Brown. I, I, I think I'm jaded by A.J. Brown because he is like my favorite wide receiver in the league, yet I don't want to be drafting him this year because I had him last season and uh, I had like the best team in my league for half of the season. Um, by the end of it, I might have had the worst team in the league. I ended up at the bottom in the playoffs. My team stunk once I got to, by the time I got to the playoffs. And a, a big part of that had to do with A.J. Brown and other wide receivers. He wasn't the only one, but just uh, he was the most disappointing of the bunch because he had been so great early in the season. Uh, he, he, he flopped just like the entire Philadelphia offense defense team did. And so I I have him ranked higher than Garrett Wilson, but like my gut keeps wanting to say Garrett Wilson over him even because I just, I'm jaded. I'm jaded by AJ Brown currently. I'll get over it. But generally speaking, uh, one through five here, one through seven, probably uh, I have confidence in both the situation and the talent among the players in this tier. That's what really keeps them separate from this next year where now I'm, I'm generally speaking, there's going to be one big question that I have for guys in this tier. And I'll go over a couple of those. This tier for me starts at, we're going to say wide receiver eight, but could be, you know, uh, we talked about like the, at the top of the second tier, there was a, for 2022, 2023, there were like a few guys that separated themselves Maybe that's our A.J. Brown and our Garrett Wilson. But this goes all the way down to uh, wide receiver 22 from wide receiver 8. So Puka Nakua all the way to D.J. Moore, I think is a tier here. Would I be shocked if D.J. Moore scores more fantasy points than Puka Nakua? Not even really a little bit. It would not be too shocking for me. So generally speaking, one big question when it comes to Puka Nakua is one of the guys here versus his uh, other wide receiver in that offense, Cooper Cup. I've got questions here. I'm not too sure that Puka Nakua is going to outscore Cooper Cup. Debo Sam is another guy here. So the question can be good or bad. In that instance, my questions for Cooper Cup are about the upside. It's a positive question. My questions about Puka Nakua are more about a concern about him being maybe a little bit overdrafted there at wide receiver eight. Uh, so for Debo Samuel, this is more of a concern question is can his efficiency continue? He relies upon being highly efficient and assuming that Brandon Ayuk does end up staying there. Um, it's a very much a concern, especially for full PPR more so than half PPR. Even, uh, he really needs to be highly, highly efficient. 
Uh, and in full PPR, it's, it's all the more downside. I, you know, he's all the more lower in my rankings if I'm if I'm drafting in that kind of scoring system. Nico Collins, crowded receiving core. It's it's a concern. Uh, how does that end up looking? Is that like Puka Nakua and Cup? Is it every other week it's somebody else in that wide receiver group that goes off? I don't know. It might be unpredictable. It might not be. But then when we look at Jalen Waddle, I'm thinking positively here. What what does a healthy year look like for Jalen Waddle? We've seen it. it. It's better than the wide receiver 17. It's a top 10 wide receiver. So th- there's an upside question there for Jalen Waddle. So once again. Each of these guys, I can propose a question about. So bring us on to tier three, 23 through 37. So that's going from Devonta Smith all the way down there to Hollywood Brown. Uh, and generally speaking, this is the final tier where I think there's a general consensus of trust. Hollywood Brown might not make it into that tier anymore. And Rasheed Rice definitely might, given that difference. Maybe Xavier Worthy is sneaking into the back end of that tier as we get closer to your draft day. Uh, but generally... A lot of us uh, do not expect these guys to completely fail to be total disappointments. That doesn't mean there won't be some in here. I'm just saying that's how we feel. There's another level of confidence through the top 37 wide receivers here, according to the ADP. Then when we get to wide receiver 38 through 42, um, this is just a little tier that I have, kind of the in-between tier. Uh, Once again, maybe now Hollywood Brown's in here and Xavier White's out of it. Uh, But that's our... They're starting to bridge out into Tier 5, which I just had another little cutoff here. It starts at 43 is the next cutoff. Going to wide receiver 47, I wrote. And then, it's like, or is it going to wide receiver 51 or, or maybe like 53, 54 there, Jacoby Myers? It, it's a, a, There's not a clear cutoff for me here for the Tier 5 and Tier 4 to Tier 5 even. Um, I think 38 to 53 is at about 15. So that would probably be our fourth tier technically. But in regards to tiers three, four, and five, as I've just laid, laid them out there, uh, each has a mix of players that ride on a scale from guys that I have a lot of faith in to guys that I have, I, I think have a lot of potential upside, but there are obstacles that exist. So uh, for Amari Cooper, T. Higgins, I have a lot of faith in those guys. But then when it comes down to like the Jordan Addisons, the Rome Adunzes, there are obstacles in the way of them being really good for my fantasy team. A guy directly in the middle of this group would be someone like DeAndre Hopkins, who, uh, you know, there's there's faith in the talent. I mean, not too long ago, he was a top five wide receiver in the league. But there are questions. Is he going to hit that uh, Julio Jones? Julio? Uh, Julio Jones kind of wall here. Uh, Questions about his age, his health, of course, coming into the season. And then the quarterback situation. Will Levis is still quite an unknown, but he did target DeAndre Hopkins a lot last year. Uh, But, hey, you know, there's a new guy in town in the wide receiver court too. So how do those things balance each other out? Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. And let's bring us on to the sixth tier. That's, uh, you know, wherever we want to make our cutoff there for that last tier, uh, about my line where there are guys that I'm willing to take a shot on late in my draft to find a gem. So I'm gem hunting all the way up to wide receiver 79 here, actually 80, Demarcus Robinson, who had a really good end once he took over as the wide receiver three for the Los Angeles Rams down the last portion of last season he actually was really really good fantasy wise like you know like flex worthy for sure type of guy so uh, that could that's something that could continue into the season that in a deeper league I'm definitely not too afraid to take a chance on that now I just want to go over some of my targets for the tiers here. So in this first tier, picks one through seven, uh, there's really no targeting these guys, of course, because you kind of take what comes to you or you're grabbing a tight end instead of them. But I do have a bust in this list, and that's going to be Justin Jefferson. I, I'm taking Jamar Chase, Monster St. Brown, A.J. Brown, Garrett Wilson easily over Justin Jefferson. After that, I mean, I I struggle on which tier he even belongs in after that is what it comes down to. So, um, you know, the quarterback situation change, I don't know if that helps or hurts. I think, to me, I'd say that gives him a little bit lower of a floor, I mean, lower of a ceiling, and maybe a more consistent floor, at least. Uh, Whether that floor is actually higher, I don't know. But um, we're not going to have that point in the season where there's a quarterback change and J.J. McCarthy getting used to the NFL for like three or four weeks where things might have been bad. 
but things might just be not good all season long. Let's bring us on to the second tier here from wide receiver 8 through wide receiver 22. And my targets in this were Chris Olave, especially for full PPR. He's kind of the guy I'm going to point out in full PPR here. Uh, Cooper Cup, Stephon Diggs. Michael Pittman is a guy who has, despite being a target, kind of tumbled in my rankings a little bit as of late. I still feel good taking him, you know, where I would take him. But um, I just uh, might be a crowded wide receiver room as well, right? So I have some concerns about that, kind of. But I also feel really confident in Michael Pittman. It's confusing. That does bring us to a sleeper that I do have, which right at the end of this group, DJ Moore, I think pretty good shot. He could outperform wide receiver 22. Uh, we've seen him outperform it with much worse quarterbacks, we assume, we think. But it is a rookie quarterback situation, and it is a stacked wide receiver room. So uh, there's a lot of reasons to think that maybe he doesn't have as good of a year as he's had in the past. I think he'll have a really good year, though. And um, a couple busts in this group, Puka Nakua and Marvin Harrison Jr., both going higher than I have them. Uh, I, I think it's going to be tough for them to to succeed uh, with the expectations. Uh, now, is Marvin Harrison Jr. a bust just because I have him five, six spots lower? I don't know. You can determine that. But um, I do have him a little bit lower as all. Well. Let's bring us on to the third tier of wide receivers here, 23 through 37. So we're looking at Devonta Smith all the way down to Hollywood Brown again there. Um, Amari Cooper, T. Higgins, you could say targets, whatever. I'm not even going to say targets, but I feel really comfortable and safe getting these guys where I can get them in the draft. Uh, they're boring, and thus they kind of fall a little bit. They're probably going to outproduce where you're getting them. Who are they going to outproduce over? I don't know, but... Uh, they're a nice, solid value. Then Malik Neighbors here, uh, if you're in a full PPR league, you definitely must have. I'd say Chris Godwin and Rasheed Rice are also guys in a full PPR league. I'm thinking all the more of in those types of formats. I had Christian Kirk in this list, but I don't know. So we're going to take him off. And then uh, I also have Rasheed Rice as a value pick here in this group. I really think that uh, Rasheed Rice would be ranked higher if it wasn't for the off-field issues that he had which don't seem like they're going to be impacting him this season too much at least uh there's really no court case that's up against him right now so um i think that's probably going to be something that ends up getting handled next year off season in one way or another and uh i think he could be a really good value uh tank dell keenan allen hollywood brown also value picks and i will say you know let's let's Maybe switch out Hollywood Brown for Xavier Worthy now with the the injury issue, but I think Hollywood Brown's only going to miss like maybe two weeks uh, is the most realistic expectation, and so when he comes back, I don't know. I, I I'd say still he's probably going to be tumbling down drafts a little bit. All the more reason to say he's a value pick. And for this group, my post is going to be George Pickens. I you know I have a lot of concerns with the quarterback situation with the talent. Um, but he is in a really good situation to soak up a lot of targets too. However, offensive coordinator Arthur Smith, I mean, we've seen this. We think that he held back Drake London quite a bit in previous offenses. Um, not to say that this quarterback situation should be a little bit better than the one that we saw in Atlanta at least, but still, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I have concerns about George Pickens uh, being a near wide receiver too. I think he's more of a flex wide receiver for me. Uh, like like a lower, like after Rasheed Rice, Hallie Brown, ahead of Deontay Johnson type of territory, depending on format. I'd even take Deontay in full PPR over him. Speaking of, uh, the next tier for a tier 38 through 42, Deontay Johnson's in that tier. And uh, I just listed this tier. We're kind of in like bust territory here. This is, like I said, this was the little tier in between the third and fifth tier. Um and so I just listed them, and I think the order of most likely to bust, in my opinion. Jordan Addison, I am the most concerned about in this group. Roma Dunze, without injury, I think it's going to be hard to be able to trust him any given week. You're going to hope that you have somebody better to start uh, than him, I think, uh, until any time that there's an injury to one of the starting two wide receivers. Then uh, I, I like him quite a bit. DeAndre Hopkins, you know, I think there's... There's definitely some bust risk there. Xavier Worthy, once Hollywood Brown's back and everything, uh, he just might be too inconsistent. That's very possible. But 
he's getting an opening here to really help cement himself into getting more opportunities throughout the entire season early on. So that goes a long ways. And is why I have him ahead of DeAndre Hopkins, actually. And then Deontay Johnson, I think, is the safest out of this pick, especially, once again, if you're in full BBR. And as I was alluding to for Xavier Worthy, he's your most boom bust. Like uh, There's a very good opportunity for him to be the best rookie wide receiver out of the bunch here this season. Uh, he's obviously in a good situation for that to happen, too. Fifth tier of wide receivers, wide receiver 43 through 53, question mark. Uh, Jordan Addison all the way down to uh, Jacoby Myers-ish area territory there. Um, I have my boom options here being the Green Bay Packers receivers, any of them. Brian Thomas Jr. I think is a definite boom opportunity back in this portion of the draft. Same with Jamison Williams. Some really good news coming out of camp on him uh, in that order uh, in terms of the boom. For PPR guys, Ladd McConkey I think is a good target here. Buffalo Bills wide receivers as well. That's Keon Coleman and Khalil Shakir. And I have those two up ahead of the other Buffalo wide receiver in Curtis Samuel. He's the least... I don't... If he is successful... I think it comes at the cost of uh, James Cook. I think Keon Coleman, Khalil Shakir, as true wide receivers, are the guys who get the most targets. Curtis Samuel, I think, is a gadget guy, but if he's a consistent gadget guy or whatever, uh, I think that most likely would hurt uh, Dalton Kincaid second and James Cook the most. Then promising preseason guy, Cortland Sutton. Uh, you know, there's health age concerns. Well, he's had previous health concerns, but uh, he he burned a dude uh, this uh, this preseason. I don't, you know, might have been a four-string receiver, uh, cornerback or something, but he's still, like, Cortland Sutton burning somebody. You like to see that. He's getting a little bit older, but he actually might feel healthier than he's felt in some time. That's quite possible. And then, you know, Bo Nix has been looking good, and Cortland Sutton has definitely been one of those guys who's outproduced his ADP plenty of seasons in the past. Uh, and the only guy I didn't talk about in that group would be JSN then. So I guess if I got to give somebody the bust label, it would be JSN, but I'm not like, like, I, th- I think he's one of those guys where I talked about, you don't want a consistent bot, like non top 40 guy because their consistency just isn't good enough. I think there's a very good chance that could be JSN. He could end up as the wide receiver 40 on the season, but most weeks he was like the wide receiver 45. He was just, Never too bad, but never good enough either to help you out. And then that brings us to the sixth tier wide receivers, 55 through 79. Um, so in this tier, I just want to talk about some of these guys. Uh, Josh Palmer is a wide receiver where if you are uh, just drafting five wide receivers, you went wide receiver strong early on. You need depth at other positions that you let go a little bit more that you're less comfortable with. I think he is the great backup, backup, uh, you know, wide receiver. Your wide receiver five if you're not taking six wide receivers in your league. Uh, just, just comfortable with, uh, you know, a floor guy, not a ceiling guy but also comfortable with, I think, what he'll end up producing throughout the season. Uh, Jerry Judy, interesting. I have no clue really what to expect. Same with Brandon Cooks. Uh, Jahan Dotson, bust label. Big time bust label here. The news has not been good on him uh, this offseason. And Mike Williams, too. I just can't get myself to draft him as much as you know what the possible upside is. Uh, there's a lot of factors, injury specifically working against that age of him and the quarterback situation. I mean... A lot of reasons why he just might not be very fantasy relevant outside of like one week all season. Uh, Dontavian Wicks, you know, he's, I think there needs to be an injury ahead of him for him to be good, but he could be uh, just like last season. When, if given the chance, Adnan Mitchell, I like what a bit Gabe Davis. I don't know what to expect there. Uh, Josh Downs, I have above Adonai Mitchell, so I like that more. But, you know, 80, a little bit more of your ceiling shot, Josh Downs, I think will be, will fit into the top 40 consistency near the back end of it. But I think he'll be just good enough that he'll be an asset uh, as a, you know, wide receiver four kind of guy on your roster. Um, outside of that, Jalen Polk, Michael Wilson, ups, Odell Beckham Jr. I think they're all upside guys. Um, you know, OBJ, Jalen Polk, it's tough to bet on them actually coming through, but the upside is pretty good if it does, I believe. For OBJ, a lot of people believe for Jalen Polk. Demario Douglas could be in that same conversation as Josh Downs, but once again, the offensive 
quarterback general offensive situation there. It's just tough to bet on that compared to some other guys. Jermaine Burton, uh, bus territory here. He's he's down on the in the depth chart right now as the wide receiver room. Uh, a couple guys that they took last year have you know have come through quite well. Most specifically, Andre Yoshivas is appears to be the wide receiver three, the slot wide receiver or or maybe Jamar Chase will be a slot mostly, but uh, appears to be like that wide receiver three that's going to be coming in as Trenton Irwin has been taking the uh, the Jamar Chase snaps, and we assume Jamar Chase will be back. Uh, outside of that, Rashad Bateman, Demarcus Robinson, the final two here. I'm definitely happy in, in a deeper draft uh, where a lot of guys have been taken, a lot of receivers, deep bench, whatever, uh, to take a shot on either one of these guys so that's going to bring us on to the next section of this video and that's just looking at the general how wide receivers are are being drafted this season and as you can see they are flying off of the board in the year 2024 of our lord and uh, speaking specifically half ppr here but even more so in full ppr i will say recent events lead me to think that maybe they're not flying off the board as much as they were a month ago but uh, just looking at very recent ADPs, uh, you got about 12 wide receivers usually being taken in the first two rounds and 11 taken in the next two rounds. So about 50% of the picks for the first four rounds of the draft are going to be wide receivers. And for me, for the tiers that I created, that's the first two tiers now completely off the board. You've already started to get into the third tier by the time before we've reached the end of the fourth round. So in the fifth, uh, yeah, fifth and sixth round, you see about eight wide receivers go off the board. A little slow down before the before things pick up again, but about one in three picks going off the board through that fifth, sixth round. And the th third tier lasts all the way from the late portion of the fourth round to the early portion of the seventh round, where you will see six wide receivers. You know, a little bit of a a last second pickup of the wide receiver group before people start to just kind of take what's uh, falling to them. Uh, so six wide receivers in the seventh round, once again, about 50% of picks. That third tier, once again, going from the fourth all the way into the seventh. And then from uh, the, the end of the mid end of the seventh tier, you know, depending on exactly where you think that these tiers break off, all the way through the 11th, you're seeing about 33% of picks being wide receivers, about four each round. We're thinking 12 team leagues here if you didn't catch on to that. Uh, from the 8th to the 11th round, four getting taken, which brings us almost perfectly through the 5th tier in those first 11 rounds. After that, we're just talking about, you know, taking shots. So be comfortable with your wide receiver core by the time that you get through the 11th round is, is what you want to be at. And so for that, I am going to take, a, you might recognize this if you watch the CBS show, um, uh, Fantasy Football CBS podcast show, uh, because I'm, I'm stealing this from them. I saw it and I thought hey, that's a fun idea. So I want blank out of my top blank wide receivers, looking at both, uh, two wide receiver and three wide receiver sets. And we are going to go to my rankings for the wide receiver rankings to do this. Cause we're talking about my wide receivers and here they are. And so out of these top 24 wide receivers i want a minimum of two of them talking about two wide receiver leagues here then out of the top uh 38 wide receivers so getting that next tier i want a minimum of four of them even if it means three out of the top 24 i want four of the top 38 wide receivers however i am okay if i only get four of the top 46 so i'm okay if my fourth wide receivers xavier worthy brian thomas jr you know roma dunze deandre hopkins in a two wide receiver league uh most notably non-ppr ppr uh you know uh I'm less okay with it, probably. And that's to bring us on to three wide receiver leagues. In which case, I want three out of my top 24 wide receivers in a three wide receiver league. I really, I, I want these guys, especially if we're talking about full PPR. Uh, so that's for the, the, and if you're drafting, you think the first 24 wide receivers, that means that's for through the first four rounds, because we know about 24 wide receivers getting taken from our previous analysis. And I want four out of my top 38. So that's three out of my top 24, four out of my top 38 wide receivers, which means if we get our three out of the top 24, uh, three wide receivers in the first four rounds, our next wide receiver just needs to come by by the seventh round. We can either take one in the fifth, fifth round or fourth round. We could take four there, but we can take one in the fifth round, sixth round, seventh round to fulfill that need to get into this tier. And I also want 
five out of my top 46 wide receivers. That leaves us with uh, one more wide receiver after we've taken our fifth through seventh round wide receiver that we need to get off of the board by like the 10th round there, maybe 11th round if you if you like some of these guys too. Uh, Corlin Sutton or something would be, you know, I think borderline, like I understand it. I got to move him up in my rankings, don't I? All right, so now you know my wants, my desires. Now let's just do a little bit more analysis in comparison to the other positions. Uh, we'll start off with the running back position. We're going to compare wide receiver to tight end and quarterback position as well. But the most apt comparison, especially when we're looking at early on in the draft, is going to be a wide receiver versus a running back. You're not, you don't compare a wide receiver to a quarterback for the most part uh, in the first round. I mean, no, nobody's taking quarterbacks in the first round. So... Uh, wide receiver ones score, uh, based on the last three years of data, on average, the wide receiver one in a half PPR league is going to score between 37.5 and 26 fantasy points on the lower end, on average, 66% of the time. Uh, the running backs going to score between 39.5 points all the way down a little bit lower to 25 points. So there's a lower ceiling for wide receivers, as you can see, right, uh, between the 37 to 39 and a half points. But the floor is higher for the wide receivers. Then when we go down to the wide receiver six versus running back six, it's pretty much an exact same floor and ceiling. You're getting about the same amount of fantasy points from either one. Then when we get to the back end of the wide receiver and running back rooms uh, on, on average each week, wide receiver 12s are going to score 18 fantasy points on the ceiling, Running backs, 17 and a half. For the floor, wide receiver, 14 and a half. Running back, 14. So you can see it's flipped. Now the wide receiver is going to score. It has a higher floor and a higher uh, ceiling, basically meaning that wide receivers uh, are now more value than running backs in every way. Uh, the average, the ceiling, the floor, more valuable. And this is a trend that continues and widens as the position goes along. How do we take this information? Well, there's two ways to argue this here. There really are. So first of all, if you want a safer, more consistent, higher floor team, then you're going to go with the wide receiver. If you want to take a risk and you want to have more boom or bust in your lineup, then you're going to get yourself the higher ceiling with a running back. Uh, I will state that that running back has to have top three to four running back potential. So this is why earlier you saw... Uh, we had the running back position pulled up here. So when we look at the running back position, I do very specifically talk about the top three to four running back potential because in 2023, there were only two running backs that averaged a running back six week or better. So you think back to that's, that's our break even point there kind of as that running back six um, score. So on average, most weeks, even a top three or four running back may not really be competing with a, a top wide receiver for the most part. So that's why I say that they need to have this top three type of potential. And for me this season, the, the I, for my money, it's these top five running backs are really the, the guys who are going to be your, I think they have the best options. There's a bit of a cutoff there. More questions for me after that, more likelihood of these five uh, being in that argument over the top 12 wide receivers, essentially. And before we leave, I will point out, too, that that's going to be a different story. For full PPR, full PPR, I mean, the tie goes to the wide receiver all the way through. You would notice that the ceiling and the floor is already going to be higher at wide receiver one in full PPR than it is at running back one in full PPR. At least most seasons, because Christian McCaffrey is such a great cat, cast pass catcher that might be different for christian mccaffrey i could see that now let's look at the wide receivers versus other positions when should you essentially when should you start to think about taking a different position a tight end or a quarterback over your next wide receiver that you're going to take off the board for wide receiver versus tight end on a weekly basis the wide receiver 24 is roughly equal to the tight end six wide receiver 24 on average scored 11.9 fantasy points over the past three seasons and the tight end six on average over the past three seasons averaged 11.7 fantasy points scored half PBR that's basically our first tier two tiers of wide receivers the first four rounds if you remember in this year's draft are our first 24 wide receivers that are getting taken off the board last year the top four tight ends all averaged below this 11.7 this tight end six number 11.5 11.5 11.4, 11.3. So you could say that on average, the number one tight end on the season, two, three, four, all still 
most weeks scored fewer fantasy points than the top 24 wide receivers or, or roughly the same to fewer than about 24 wide receivers most weeks. Editor Steve here. I just had to uh, remove a portion where I made some analysis that I double checked. I don't think that that was quite the best, uh, most accurate analysis, but the real short of it is, is that there's going to be, uh, if, if a wide receiver has the potential, in your opinion, to be a top 10 wide receiver, realistically, obviously a lot of them have some sort of percentage chance of being a top 10 wide receiver, but that's about the cutoff. A top 10 wide receiver, they should be taken over the tight end position. Once you get to that point where you're really questioning their ability to even do that, then you can realistically go ahead and draft a tight end and not feel like you're making a mistake value-wise, fantasy points-wise uh, to your team in, in either regard. So, so there we go. Back to the regularly scheduled video. Now, the you know the argument here for taking a tight end would be positional advantage. The thing is that uh, unlike other years, the tight end position is very deep and the top end is a little bit lower. Travis Kelsey is not scoring... Uh, the same amount of average fantasy. I think he was up to like 13.7, 14 or something like that. Got you much closer to being a top wide receiver no type of number. Now there's about, instead of one wide receiver who's at the top of the class, there's about five of them who all could be most likely the wide, tight end number one by the end of the season. And they're all fighting, you know, probably in this range that we saw last year's uh, tight ends end in, uh, that kind of that average tight end six type of range for scoring. So uh, there's just less need to get that positional advantage. But I do think that you want to get in on those first five tight ends if possible. So I'm all for, like, Dalton Kincaid is the last one typically off of the board of that front group. Uh, if you can target him, I think that's a real real good value let's bring us on to wide receivers versus the quarterback position the wide receiver 10 uh roughly is equal to the quarterback 12 roughly about 17.9 fantasy points obviously i keep track of the wide receiver six i keep track of the wide receiver 12 i don't keep track of every single uh interval in between but the number that we were looking for was 17.9 which was probably about wide receiver 10 so as you can see uh, we have kind of a, an inverse of the, the problem with the tight ends. So so why don't we just take a quarterback right away? Well, it's because we look at how many quarterbacks averaged this type of score. Uh, last year, 14 quarterbacks. And I went back. Uh, oh, 14 quarterbacks averaged almost 17.9 fantasy points or more uh, over the past three seasons. I went back 2023, 2022, 2021. And the number on average was about 14 of them consistently scoring over that number. So why rust the position when there's more than enough of them compared to those wide receivers? This makes, you know, there's a lot of parity at the quarterback position, whereas the top wide receivers are more rare. So you want to take as many shots as you can get to get a top 10 wide receiver, which might be the 20th wide receiver off the board. You know, Tank Dell could be a top 10 wide receiver. So you want to take those shots at getting that guy before you take a shot at quarterback when you can get a top 14 quarterback with the last pick of the draft possibly or I would say more realistically, I think it ends around like Jaden Dan around the tenth round is where you still have a shot at getting like a top seven quarterback. So um, that that is why you, you continue to attack wide receivers for longer, even though the fact that quarterbacks do score more points uh, typically. Bring us on to the injury position. Wide receiver injuries do not create one for one replacements. Comparing that to uh, the running back position, which Oftentimes, one of the running back up running backs is the next guy up in line. In terms of the, the health of the wide receiver position, about 50% of wide receivers will remain healthy for all but uh, all games, or maybe they'll just miss one game. Whereas for the running back position, and this is after we remove season-ending injuries to guys who played in just a few games. Like, I can't remember. I think my cutoff was seven games even or less. But uh, less than half of the season. Let's say it might have been like four games or preseason. Uh, J.K. Dobbins, I know a couple years ago from this data, wouldn't have been included in this 35% number. Uh, so that would have lowered the number. The, the number... Uh, of running backs that end up being remaining healthy of drafted running backs uh, typically who who played in more than half of the games we'll say was 35 percent so there's a 35 percent chance that a running back remains completely healthy throughout the season or 
misses just one game. That's pretty significantly less than that 50% number for the wide receiver position. Another risk that you're taking if you're taking a running back over a wide receiver as your, you know, your first pick, any pick really, but uh, specifically talking about maybe trying to limit risk uh, being risk adverse earlier on in the draft, getting more risky as the draft goes on, um, being more open to taking on risk. Uh, on average games, uh, wide receivers on average should be healthy for one more game than the running backs. Once again, this is a selective running back group. This is after removing the season-ending injury guys for the most part, the guys who played in a game or two. Uh, so expect roughly 12 to 13 games from running backs, 12 and a half, 13 to 14. 14 games for wide receivers so once again you're also getting another one plus game healthier for your wide receiver how many years have you just been like oh if i just had one more week i could have made the playoffs here you go here's that game now you're in the playoffs and your opponent isn't so uh a little bit safer once again drafting those wide receivers and then uh, you might think like a lot of people think and, and this includes me at one point in time However, I've kind of changed my opinion on this, that you can find late gems and sleepers easily. And to an extent, I do think that uh, this is true. I think that it's easy enough to replace a top 30-ish type of wide receiver. Easy enough. But it is not easy to replace a top 15 wide receiver, although you can. A lot of times on the waiver wire, uh, there are several guys who are quite boring. Once again, they're those guys who, uh, you know, 8.9 fantasy points almost every week. That's what they're averaging. Those guys exist on the waiver wire you can get them but they're boring and a lot of times you look over them because you want uh you're looking at the names on the waiver wire you want one of those guys who has a chance of blowing up from based on whatever circumstances and once again i think it's easy enough to nail that list down we do it waiver wire every week we list some of these guys who we think have a chance the only thing is that the hit rate on those is going to be maybe like 25 percent. you give me a chance to list five of them i'm going to get one or two of them right and you know one of them that i get wrong Probably just dropped the touchdown catch. That happens plenty. Uh, they, they got the 67-yard touchdown throw. They were wide open, and they just dropped the ball. So what I'm saying is the actual choosing the correct guy on any given week once your wide receiver goes down or something is not as easy as I think a lot of people think that it is. But they do exist, too. So that's always a good thing. That's going to bring us on to the wide receiver strategy here. Uh, thinking about going wide receiver, wide receiver, I think that this is a very strong start, especially for a three wide receiver league or a full PPR league or three wide receiver and full PPR, especially. Uh, very strong start. You might be giving up on some flexibility uh, compared to going wide receiver running back. But uh, I think you're really only giving up on some flexibility in two wide receiver leagues. Something to keep in mind, though, is that I, I'm not too worried about giving up a little bit of flexibility there because I'm happy to fill out my flex spot before I fill out a running back spot. It, it, 19 points in my flex spot is the same as getting 19 points out of my running back spot. It doesn't matter where those 19 points come from as long as, as, long as it's 19 instead of 15 because I felt like I had to get a running back off the board and then I left a wide receiver who averages, you know, five more points a week. Even with that in mind, I think that we can find some really talented running backs later on in the draft this year as well. So I'm definitely fine going wide receiver, wide receiver. I will say in my prep for my last draft from uh, the ninth pick, I found that uh, I just felt more comfortable going running back, wide receiver, specifically in that order, just because of, otherwise I would have been taking Chris Olave probably. Uh, well, or A.J. Brown and then a running back that I didn't want. So I felt really comfortable taking Saquon Barkley because I have him as my number three wide, four wide receiver uh, running back. And then uh, and then getting Chris Olave, both of them would always be there for me. And both of them I liked more than the other running backs and the other wide receivers on the board. So it just adds up because I, I kept trying to do like wide receiver, wide receiver around that turn, A.J. Brown, Chris Olave. And uh, the running backs are just going that much earlier. And some of my targets are odd in terms of uh, getting taken towards the end of the draft. I, I'd have to uh, reach for them uh, in times where sometimes I might want to, to take a tight end that happens to fall or something a little bit farther. So uh, I end up finding comfort in going running back wide receiver. I will say that for that's uh, two, two wide receiver league there. When it comes to zero wide receiver, uh, talking about running back, running back, running back tight end, running back quarterback starts, whatever the case there. Uh, 
I don't really care for. You're talking late round versus early round here from pick one to two. You can definitely get yourself a running back and then like a tight end or a quarterback around that next turn, the number one tight end or the number one quarterback, if you wish. Um, so, you know, there is that to think about. Uh, from a late draft position, you can definitely get yourself a nice duo of running backs, running back, running back, and then uh, quarterback or tight end, third and fourth round actually works pretty decently there, depending on what you think, and then wide receiver in the fifth round. So what I will say for going zero wide receiver, uh, first of all, three wide receiver league, full PPR, two wide receiver or three wide receiver, really. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to advocate for it. I don't like it. What I will say that you could get away with in a two wide receiver league, half PPR, standard scoring, is going running back, running back, quarterback, tight end, as I just kind of alluded to, and then getting a wide receiver. Because that means that you could get two tier three wide receivers. You can get by at that. And you have obviously can, should have the best running back room uh, one, and probably the QB one and like the tight end three or something or QB two, tight end two, you know, uh, somewhere in that range is, is quite possible for you to get and get that advantage. So um, I do not recommend this. I highly recommend at the very least going hero wide receiver if you want to get some of these other positions early. Grabbing one of those wide receivers between the second and fourth round. Uh, just get on before waiting all the way to the fifth round there. Get one of those top 24 wide receivers. I think goes a long ways. So that is it for the video. Thank you very, very much for tuning on in. Let me know what you think. And I will be back with a running back video. And then we will do a tight end and quarterback video, I think, all in one. So I'll shorten that one up a little bit. Peace out.